So anyway, the course I'm going to teach is called Financial Theory, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to teach an actual class. I'm going to spend the first half of the class talking about the course and why you might be interested in it, and then I'm going to start with the course. I mean, there are not that many uh, lectures available in the semester, so I'm not going to waste this one. So the first half of the class is going to be about why to study it and the mechanics of the course, and the second half of the lecture is going to be actually the first part of the course. It'll give you maybe an idea of whether you'll find the course interesting, too. So... Um, I think I'll turn this, I won't have too much PowerPoint here. So you should know that finance was not taught until 10 years ago at Yale. It was regarded by the deans and the classically minded faculty of the arts and sciences as a vocational subject, not worthy of being taught to Yale undergraduates. Um, it was growing more and more famous, however, in the world, and there was a band of business school professors, Fisher Black, Robert Merton, William Sharp, Steve Ross, Myron Scholes, Merton Miller, who had a huge following in business schools teaching the subject and whose students went off on to Wall Street and, and more or less dominated the investment banking to, uh, parts of Wall Street and became extremely successful. Uh, finance became the most highly paid uh, profession. It became the most highly paid faculty in the university, although they were all in business schools. Uh, there are more physics PhDs working in finance now than there are working in physics. Um, so this merry band of financial theory professors didn't really believe in regulation. They believed markets left unfettered uh, work best of all. They believed in what they called efficient markets and the idea that asset prices reflect all the available possible information. So an implication of that is that if you want to find out whether a company is doing well or not, you don't have to take the trouble to read all their financial reports, just look at their stock price. If you want to know whether a country is doing well or not, you don't have to study its entire political system and uh, you know, current events, just look at the general stock market of the country and that'll tell you. They believed that you could make as good returns in the market as a layperson as you could as an expert, because all the experts were competing to try and get the best possible price, and so the price itself reflected all their knowledge and wisdom and opinions, and so the layperson could take advantage of that by buying stocks. Everybody should be an investor, they felt. Uh, a monkey throwing darts at a dartboard would do as well as any of the greatest experts. Now, their own theory was basically contradicted by their own experience because all of them seemed to go out into the world uh, and, and invest and almost all of them made extraordinary returns and made a huge amount of money, all of which made them even less popular in the faculty of arts and sciences. So a critical part of their theory was that the markets are so efficient, driven by people like them who are competing to exploit every advantage and therefore compete away every advantage and by doing that uh, put all the information they have into the prices. The implication of that theory is that there's an extraordinarily clever way of computing the value of most investment assets and about deciding when a financial decision is a good thing to do or not. And that was the heart of what they taught in these business schools, these algorithms for valuing assets and making optimal financial decisions. Uh, one striking thing is that the people they studied, the business, school, the, the, uh, the business people and the investment bankers they studied, adopted their language. So this had never happened in academia before. I mean, anthropologists study, you know, primitive tribes and different kinds of people all the time, and not one of them, I venture to say, has ever taken over all the language invented by anthropologists to behave themselves in their own societies. <coughs> But the business people that these professors were studying ended up using exactly the language created uh, in academia. Now, Yale was very different. There was no divide between economists and uh, finance people, all these other, you know, the business school finance people. In, in, at, at Yale, the greatest economists in Yale's history were actually very interested in finance. Maybe they were financial economists to begin with. So the greatest Yale economist of the first half of the 20th century was Irving Fisher, who you hear a lot about. He wrote 
possibly the first economics PhD at Yale. There was no economist to teach him, so he had to write his PhD with Gibbs, uh, the great, maybe the greatest American physicist of the time. There's a building, as you know, on Science Hill named after Gibbs. And uh, you'll, you'll hear more about his dissertation in the 1890s. But he was a mathematical economist, an econometrician, but he invented almost all of his economics in order to study finance. The most famous Yale economist of the second half of the 20th century was James Tobin, a famous macroeconomist. Uh, the most famous macroeconomist possibly of the 20th, uh, second half of the 20th century after Keynes, a great Keynesian. But he got the Nobel Prize for work he did on finance and economics. Finance was incredibly interesting to him. So Bob Schiller and I went to Yale and we basically said to the deans, there's a long tradition of finance and economics hand in hand um, at Yale. And so you, it's not a vocational subject. It's actually central to economics and central to understanding the economy and central to understanding the global economy. So we'd like to teach it to Yale undergraduates. And we believe a few of them will actually take the course. And so they um, agreed to let us do it. And so we've been teaching it now for the, for the last uh, 10 years. So as you know, um, Schiller is very, has been very critical of the business uh, efficient markets tradition. Uh, he feels that these finance professors left something essential out of the whole story. What they left out was psychology. They left out the idea of fads and uh, rumors and narratives, which they thought, which he thinks, has as big an effect on prices as the hard information about profits that the business school professors imagined drove profits. Um, I myself have been quite critical of the uh, financial theory. I started off as a uh, straight, pure mathematical economist. Um, it, to me, economics is almost a branch of logic and philosophy that happened to tell you something about the world. Um, so I got my PhD with Ken Arrow, who you'll hear a lot about very shortly. And I came to Yale. Uh, I'd been a Yale undergraduate. I came back to Yale. And I joined the Coles Foundation. The Coles Foundation's motto was basically, can we make economics more mathematical? Economics, a social science, ought to be uh, amenable to mathematical analysis, just like physics or chemistry is. And people didn't believe this at first. And the Coles Foundation, uh, which you'll hear a lot about in these lectures, led the revolution in economics, transforming it from a a uh, verbal subject, political economy, into a mathematical subject. Well, I decided around 1989 that since I did mathematical economics and there are all these finance people doing all kinds of mathematical things on Wall Street uh, and doing it very successfully, you know, I thought I might just check out what they were doing. So it might be fun to see what they were up to. So I, I went to uh, to Wall Street and I joined, uh, most people I knew, fact professors I knew went to Goldman Sachs. There was a famous uh, finance professor who I mentioned before named Fisher Black who was there at the time and he attracted a lot of people and so that was the traditional thing to do but I decided to go to a littler firm called Kidder Peabody and uh, one thing, it was the seventh biggest investment bank at the time and one thing led to another um, and they decided that they wanted to reorganize their research department in fixed income. And since I was a professor there and I did mathematical economics and I was there for the whole year, somebody said, the director of fixed income department said, why don't you take charge of it and hire a new fixed income research department for me? So I did and ultimately there were 75 people in the department. All the time I was a professor at Yale. And after five years, um, Kidder Peabody, even though it was 135 years old, formed by a famous family, the name should sound Peabody, familiar to you, um, it closed down after 135 years, five years after I got there. I had to invite the 75 people I'd hired into my office and say, you're fired. And then I went next door to the office next to mine, and the guy there said, you're fired. And so, <laughs> so that was my first taste of Wall Street. And after that, um, six of us founded a hedge fund called Ellington Capital Management, um, which is a mortgage hedge fund. And uh, we had, um, I'll tell you a lot about, uh, about it. It started after the Kidder closing. Um, 
uh, as a rather small hedge fund, but it grew into a very big mortgage hedge fund. In fact, the, the biggest mortgage hedge fund in the country, although recently we found out that pra practically everybody who trades mortgages is basically a hedge fund. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they're all basically hedge funds, so it doesn't mean anything anymore to say that you're a big mortgage hedge fund. But anyway, we almost went out of business in 98, a subject, a story I'll tell you at great length, and then we just suffered through this disastrous last year or two, but we're still here. So these experiences, of course, have colored my understanding of Wall Street and my approach to the subject. So I took on, in my theoretical work, finance and economic theory on its own terms. I didn't think like Schiller to introduce psychology into economics. I just take it on on its own terms, on its own mathematical terms. And what I found was that there are two things missing in the standard theory. One is that it, basically, it implicitly assumes you can buy insurance for everything. It's the assumption that's called complete markets. And secondly, it leaves out collateral entirely. So you'll never see almost in any single economics textbook the idea of collateral or leverage. And those, I think, the idea that you can't get insurance for everything and that you need collateral. You, know, you have to be able to convince someone you're going to pay him back if you borrow money. And collateral is the most convincing way of uh, persuading him he's going to be paid back, the lender. Those two things were missing from the standard theory. So I have built a theory around incomplete markets and leverage, um, uh, which, it's, which is a critique of the standard theory. So in a way, Schiller and I have been vindicated uh, by the crash. I mean. Uh, so let me just show you uh, a picture here. Uh, maybe I will, um, you know, how bad the crash was. So let's look at the Dow Jones. Uh, the Dow Jones. Uh, the Dow Jones is an average of 30 stocks, and what their value is. We'll talk more about it later. But here it is, back to 1913, moving along, greasily going up and up and up. Um, you know, there are a few blips, which uh, we'll come to later, like this one, okay, in 1929, and then, but look what happened lately, look at that, the Dow Jones was up at 14,000, and it dropped to, you know, 6,500, something like that, I'm more than a 50% drop, and now it's gone 50% up again, so if you believe these finance professors, you'll have, you'd have to say that everybody realized that pro future profits in America were going to be less than half what they thought they were going to be before, and that's why the stock market uh, dropped. And then miraculously, when it hit a bottom, everybody figured, oh my gosh, we misunderstood things. Actually, it's not nearly that bad, and things are 50% higher because now people think that profits really weren't going to go, you know, didn't drop in half, they only, didn't drop by 50%, they only dropped by 25%. And that would be the only way, according to the old theory, to explain what happened. Now, uh, Schiller would just say, well, everybody's, you know, they're crazy. They got this into their head that the world was just going to be great. And then, you know, some rumor started and things were so high and people, you know, the narrative changed and they thought things were terrible. And, you know, that's his story. And I'm not sure how he gets it to go up again. They changed their mind again. But, okay, so, um, all right. Now, by the way, it's a little bit better to look at the uh, Dow in, in um, sorry, correcting for inflation, and then you see that, uh, you know, the 1929 crash looks, and this is on a log scale, so the same, abs you know, remember before, the depression, you know, the stock market was so low, it's grown so much over 100 years that it hardly seemed like anything was happening. Well, now in log scale, uh, you know, going up two of these is multiplying by 10, you see that the the, in the depression in 1929 through the early 30s, the stock market fell. You know, I don't remember what it is. It looks like it's almost two things. It looks like it's 80 or 90 percent. And uh, the, the fall this time has been, you know, much smaller, 50 percent, not 90 percent. So it's a whole thing down, but not two, not two things down. Okay, so it, it's not a whole thing down. It's less than that. If, you know, a whole thing down would be the square root of 10 or a three, you know, a third. It didn't go down two thirds. It went down less than two thirds. It went down 50 percent. So the actual percentage drop was much worse in the depression than it is now. Okay, but now we're going to com come back to all these things. What else can we get out of these numbers? I just want you to notice a couple other things. Suppose you look, so these numbers are all very interesting. If you're mathematical, these are sort of the sorts of things you pay attention to. So these efficient markets guys, they looked at the change in price every month. So there's a lot to say for their theory. They said, look, 
it goes up and down randomly. In fact, we'll see that there are all kinds of tests about whether you can predict it's going to go up tomorrow on the basis of how it did yesterday, and the answer is no. It's very difficult to predict whether the stock market's going up or down. It seems to be random. Well, it's random, and they used to think it was normally distributed. A lot of people argued it was normally distributed, but you know, it's hard. You never get these gigantic outliers if things are normally distributed. They're just way too unlikely to happen. So Mandelbrot was, who was a Yale professor who retired a couple years ago, although he wasn't when he formed his theories, the inventor of fractals, he said this couldn't possibly be a random walk in the traditional Brownian motion sense of the word because you'd never get these big outliers. But he offered no explanation for why they might be there. And you know, I don't know if Schiller has an explanation either. I mean, is it that people suddenly get shocked one day and then the next week they change their mind and things aren't so bad after all? Um, but you'll see that the theory of collateral and margins does explain these kinds of things. Okay, now, let's just look at the Dow. Uh, not that we just looked at the Dow, let's look at another, the S&P 500. Okay, so, um, where's the S&P 500? 